Hi, my name is Rebecca Kiesling. I'm very glad to be here. I was adapted nearly from birth, and like many adaptees, for years I dreamed of being able to meet my birth mother. My search began on my 18th birthday, and I was told that that door was closed, and that I would never have the opportunity to meet her. It was very difficult for me. But I went on to petition for my non-identifying information. And when it arrived, it had everything you could imagine about my birth mother except for her name. It had her eye color, hair color, height, weight, age, the age of my half-brother and half-sister who were 11 and 13 when I was born, her ethnicity, religious background, occupation, educational level, detailed medical history. And I just hung on to every word. But then for my father, it said that he was Caucasian and of large build. And that was it. And I thought, that sounds like a police description. I mean, come on, she couldn't even say his eye color, hair color, nothing. I called up my caseworker and I asked her, was my mom raped? And she said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you. And I was just devastated. I remember feeling so ugly and so unwanted, thinking, who would ever love me? And then, of course, at the same time, I thought about the issue of abortion, because that's what you always hear about, right? And all of a sudden, it was as if it, I could hear the echoes of all those people who would say, well, except in cases of rape, hmm? Or, uh, especially in cases of rape. And now all those people were talking about me, about my life. And I felt like I had at least half the world against me. That there's all these people out there who don't even know me, who are standing in judgment of my life. So quick to dismiss it just because of how I was conceived. And I felt like I was now going to have to justify my own existence. That I would have to prove myself to the world that I shouldn't have been aborted. And that I was worthy of living. I wanted to prove myself to the world. I also wanted to meet my birth mother. And I wanted to hear that maybe there was some mistake, that this was not how I was conceived. When I met her, she was thrilled to be able to meet me. I finally received a letter with my birth name, which was Judy Ann Miracle. So I was a miracle, baby. I thought that was kind of cool. And it had her name, Joanne, with her phone number, trembling, I called her. And she told me that she was sorry to hear that I already knew. But then she filled me in on some horrific details that I was totally unequipped to hear. She was 4'10", weighed 90 pounds, really petite. Single mom heading to the grocery store at night right down the street from her home. The guy jumped out of the bushes with a knife dragged her to a field, slid open her clothes with a knife, and basically she went on to describe for me in graphic detail how he brutally raped her. And that's how I was conceived. And that was so hard to hear for several reasons. To think that I was conceived out of a truly worst-case scenario, I just felt totally worthless, like garbage. Because of people who would say that my life was like garbage, that I was disposable. And then I had to realize that my biological father was a really bad man. She said that they knew that this was a serial rapist. But she stopped going to the police lineups because she wouldn't recognize his face. And all these years, I had really dreamed so much of meeting her. I had written poetry about meeting her. And so to hear that she had been violated like this really pained me. Well, she sent me a beautiful letter. She said, hoping by now that the shock of finding out all the details of your birth are forgotten. For that was not reason enough of having to give up something as beautiful as you were, nothing as precious as a baby. And In the, in the closing, she said, it's so great, big, beautiful, it's always been my dream. I am so happy I'm crying. A love that ate at me for 19 years, my daughter at last. With love, your mom, Joanne. That was all my dreams come true. When I met her, she was thrilled to meet me. But then I asked her about abortion because I still needed to know. 
And she told me that if it had been legal in Michigan, she would have aborted me. And in fact, she went to two back alley abortionists, and I was almost aborted. The first, it was the typical conditions that you hear about as to why she should have been able to safely and legally abort me. Blunder on the floor and on the tables. And those back alley conditions and the fact that it was illegal caused her to back out as it did for most women. And then she got hooked up with a more expensive abortionist. Once again, through the rape counselor that the police had referred her to, she said there were no pregnancy centers back then. But if there had been, she would have gone. And this time she was to meet someone at night in Detroit. Someone would approach her, say her name, blindfold her, put her in the back seat of a car, then take her and abort me, blindfold her down and drop her back off. And I think it's just so pathetic that there are so many people out there who would hear me describe those conditions. And their response would just be, oh, like, it's just so awful that your birth mother should have had to have gone through that in order to have been able to abort you. Oh, like, that's compassionate? Because I know that they think that they're being compassionate. But that's pretty cold-hearted from where I stand, don't you think? Because that is my life that they're so callously talking about. She's okay if life went on for her. But I would have been killed through a brutal abortion. I may not look the same as I did when I was four years old or four days old, yet unborn in my mother's womb, but that was me. And I would have been killed. <laughs> In law school, oh, well, let me say, too, that this abortion doctor had a filthy mouth, like so many of them do. And when she was concerned for her safety, he told her she was stupid, went on to swear at her, and she finally just hung up. He called her back the next day. Once again, to try to talk her into it, and the same thing happened. You know, for some people, their near-death experience is waking up out of a coma to find out that they were almost killed in an automobile accident. For me, this is my near-death experience. And the fact that I was younger doesn't make it any less real or any less significant. And people would say, oh, well, you were lucky. I wasn't lucky. I was protected. And pro-life heroes who, without even knowing of my exact existence, recognized that mine was a life worth saving, and they made sure that abortion was illegal in Michigan even in cases of rape. No exceptions, no compromise. They are my hero, and I owe my life to them. And that is why I, in turn, do the same for others. And then I'd have people say, oh, well, if you had been aborted, you wouldn't be here today, and you wouldn't know the difference anyway, so what does it matter? And I'd explain how their logic would justify me killing you today because you wouldn't be here tomorrow, and you wouldn't know the difference anyway, so what does it matter? And they just stand there like, it's amazing what a little logic can do. <laughs> and the fact is that there are lives who are not here today because they were aborted. Their lives matter. My life matters. Your lives matter. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. One of the greatest things that I've learned is that the rapist is not my creator as some people would have me believe. My value and identity are not established as being a product of rape, but a child of God. There are no words that... Thank you. There, there are really no words that any person could say to me that could heal me, that could make up what I've learned and what I've been through, but when I read God's word on it, it spoke to the depths of my soul. Though my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Oh, who else is going to say that to me? Society will receive us. And a father to the fatherless is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. I know there's no stigma in being adopted. We're told it's in the spirit of adoption that we're all called to be God's children through Christ our Lord. Not second best, last resort only for the infertile, but God's first choice and meant for the body of Christ. So when, when my... Husband and I got married. My birth mother was walked down the aisle in our wedding as one of the mothers. We went on to adopt first, and my birth mother's grandma, Joanne, to all of our children. Um, we have two adopted. We had a special needs baby who were adopting, Cassie, who ultimately died in our arms at 33 days old. And we have three biological daughters. Um, closed my law practice where I did pro-life legal work 
to homeschool my children and to be able to come and speak to you. And uh, it's been just the greatest years of my life have been these last several. But my value is not based upon what I do with my life. But I have an infinite value. No more, no less than any of you. But yes, I am God's gift to this world. <laughs> and you are too. I hope you know your own worth. When you can say that you are pro-life without exception, it's like saying, I get it. You all matter. Yours were lives worth saving. Now go forth and do the same for others. Thank you.